When it comes to the church, you, maybe you've heard this before. You're a bunch of hypocrites. I don't even know why you go to church. These are the words that the world throws at us. Justified? Sometimes. But these are the things that Jesus wants to undo in our lives. Each of us are guilty to, at some level or another of being a hypocrite. This series has revealed a lot about what Jesus desires for us. We've already learned that he doesn't want us to be indifferent about our faith. And in fact, he remember the word? What was the word he used when he talked about indifference? Lukewarm. Yeah, that was the word. He doesn't want us to be lukewarm. He doesn't want us to have this spirit of self-sufficiency. And then last week, we learned, didn't we? That too many times we allow ourselves to enter into what we call hollow worship. When the worship is more about me than it is about Jesus. And he wants to undo these things. In fact, we learned last week of this word that is so harsh to so many. But Jesus himself introduced it. That word, hypocrite. He used it often, talking to religious leaders and the like. Now, some people think of hypocrite this way. Some mistakenly think that they are free to sin as long as I'm not hypocritical about it. Right? Mm. Some people believe that hypocrisy is one of the worst sins that you can engage in. I mean, you often hear these words. I know I'm not perfect, but at least I'm not a hypocrite about it. You know, a few years ago, in Texas, there was, this is a real story. There was a bank robbery, and two individuals took it upon themselves to rob this bank. Now, one of them had a mask on. The other, for whatever reason, didn't, which seemed a little odd to me. But nevertheless, they both got caught, and they both went to trial. And the one that was without the mask stood before the judge, and he stated, he says, I want you to know that I know that robbing a bank is wrong, and I shouldn't have done it. But at least I didn't hide behind a mask. At least I wasn't hypocritical about it. I mean, certainly, judge, this will give me a little bit of leniency, leniency when, when you bring the judgment. The judge shook his head and said, no, you both get the same sentence in jail. Now, if I was a judge, I would have gave him more just for being stupid, you know? <laughs> I'm thinking, why would you think you'd get away with that? I mean, there's cameras everywhere. But he thought he was above the law. He perceived himself differently than everybody else did. When you think about uh, hypocrisy, really what it refers to is the act of claiming to believe something, but acting a different way. The word is derived from a Greek word that literally means actor, one who puts on a mask, one who pretends to be something they are not. Have you ever heard the term, face the music? Do you know where that came from? It was interesting when you look that up. There was an imperial orchestra that was in high demand. Everybody wanted to be a part of it. But this one individual didn't have the talent to be in a part of this imperial orchestra, but he did have resources and influence. So he convinced the, the conductor to let him sit on a seat and hold an instrument and pretend to be a musician. Well, that lasted for about two years until the conductor was replaced. And with that new conductor, he says, okay, everybody has to come in and try out for their seat. And as it came to his, he faked an illness. But then he was given a clean bill of health. So finally he had to sit before the conductor and he had to admit, I don't even know how to play. I just wanted to be a part of this. And that's where that came from. You have to face the music. And it's interesting how we, at times, don't see this as sin. It's just a white lie. You know, I, I'm not really there. But, you know, there's really two forms of hypocrisy that we can really look at. The one where we say we believe one thing and end up conducting ourselves in another. Or you can be that person that points the finger and judges everybody else when you know full well that you have the same element of sin in your life. That's hypocrisy. 
You know, when you think of the word hypocrite, is it really that big of a deal? I believe it is. I mean, hypocrisy or a form of that word, it shows up around 40 times in the Bible. So I think it's kind of a big deal. In fact, Jesus had more to say on this sin than any other person in Scripture. Jesus knew that this would be the number one excuse that people would use to not come to church, to not be committed to Jesus because of all you hypocrites. That's what they want to use. But I'm here to tell you today that Jesus wants to help each of us break through this form of acting and figure this out, that we don't have it all figured out, that we are sinful beings, that we understand our sin nature, that we stand in our sin nature with an understanding of a desperate spirit for a Savior in Jesus. That's what he desires for us. When we pretend that we don't struggle with sin, guess what happens? We become one of the biggest obstacles for those who do know they are sinning to find a Savior. We become that obstacle. But here's what I want to tell you today. Number one, Jesus wants to undo the illusion of righteousness. Oh, how so many of us live there. And the illusion of righteousness. You know, it's easy to sit back, isn't it? And judge and, and point the finger and look at how Jesus took on the religious leaders and called them hypocrites, as if that can't happen to us. How foolish. When our words of praise and commitment to God don't match up with our daily practices, I mean, we get ready. We put our crosses on. We got our Christian T-shirts on. We got our fish on the back of our car. We got all these things going on. But then when we open our mouths up, what do we do? We destroy our witness. We destroy it in a moment, in a second. Everything that we hope to stand for, we took out with our own sinful nature. Huh. No wonder we hear these words. You hypocrite. You're a fake. You're a fraud. Now, some will just say that because they're looking for an excuse, right? It doesn't matter how we live our lives out. They don't want Jesus anyway. I think Jesus took this pretty serious. And I want to show you how serious this is to Jesus, our Lord and Savior. In Luke chapter 6, what he begins to present is what he desires for us. And what he desires for us is that we don't judge. Don't judge or you'll be judged. He says, give, forgive, love. He goes through all these things that he wants us to do. But then he reaches a point. Jesus saying, why do you worry so much about the speck in the eye of your brother or sister when you have a log in your own? Why don't you deal with that first? He goes on to talk about fruit. He says a, a good fruit tree well, can't produce bad fruit, and a bad fruit tree can't produce good fruit. He's saying, do you see the conflict here? You can't say that you're a follower of mine and not live it out. In fact, we see this in his word we pick it up in verse 46. He says, so why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. He's challenging us, getting us to realize what is before us. Now, the scripture makes reference to each of us in it. Which are we? Which are we? Are, the, are we the one who claims to be a follower? Or is he going to be able to look into our lives and say, you, you are my example because you came to me. You surrendered to me, and now I can use you in all of your brokenness. This was never a message of perfection, but this was a message of imperfection in me. Now he has something to work with. But so often we portray ourselves as something greater. Now I see this as Paul also addressed it in the church. Jesus wasn't the only one that addressed these issues. We see this in Titus. It's an interesting time where Paul is, is talking to Titus and saying, hey, I'm going to leave you on the island of Crete. We're going to establish these churches. You get this leadership in place. And here's the things that I want of these leaders. This is what I want of my followers. And he goes through, and I encourage you to read this. 
He says, I want them to be made up of all these wonderful attributes and characters that reflect me. But then he reaches a point in his letter, and he says, but there's a rebellious spirit here. They're not living in the truth. They don't care about the truth. And he comes to a point in this letter. In verse 16, he says, such people claim they know God, but they deny him by the way they live. They are detestable and disobedient, worthless for doing anything that is good. Do we hear what he's saying? And this was in the establishment of the church. He dealt with these issues. You know, this is a strong warning because there are strong implications for Christ's mission when we live in an illusion of righteousness. Now, I know that our lives don't, always don't match up exactly the way that we'd hoped. Now, I'm sure there's nobody out here that, that deals with road rage, right? None? Okay. <laughs> All right, illusion of righteousness, right? Well, on this one particular day, it was interesting. I mean, I, I was going about my business, came up to a four-way stop. I believed that I was there first, and I proceeded on. The guy to the left did not agree with me, all right? So as soon as we turn, that guy is on my tail, I mean, just honking his horn. I look in the rearview mirror, and he's pointing to heaven. I, don't, I look up, and I don't know what he's pointing to. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> And I'm just driving, I'm thinking, what's this guy's problem? And as soon as he was able to get around me, he took off and went. And wouldn't you know it, on the back of his car was a bumper sticker, follow me to church. <laughs> he must have been driving his wife's car, right? Uh-huh. Because <laughs> it surely wasn't him. But you see, that is so critical of what Jesus is talking about. We love to put it out there. I'm a prayer warrior. I love Jesus. But then when we live it out, does it even resemble what we said? Does it even resemble who he is? Now, it's interesting how we can miss this mark. And I want you to turn with me in Matthew. In Matthew chapter 23, in this one chapter, Jesus uses the word hypocrite six times in one chapter. So do you think he's taking it serious? I do. So as he progresses through this, he reaches a point with these religious leaders Jesus is really kind of criticizing them on, on their conduct in life. And he reaches this point. Let's begin with verse 25. He says, What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites? You are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will become clean too. So he didn't just call them out. He gave them an answer. He says, here's the so what. I know that you're filthy, but I've given you the ability to be clean. But they don't hear it, do they? They're often too blind in that moment. I mean, you've heard me say the statement many times. Who you are behind closed doors is who you are. You may be able to fool me, but you cannot fool God. We have to make sure that we are matching up. We must live beyond the outward appearance and live to the very core for Christ. But listen, he doesn't stop there. Verse 27, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, exactly the same phrase. For you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly, you look like righteous people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. Do you hear? These are the words of Jesus. He says we need to take this serious. Too often we don't. Too often we just miss this. The illusion of righteousness is a thing that we will all battle. And if we don't come to terms with our sin nature, that it is alive and well in our lives until we are taken from this earth, we're going to live as fools, believing one thing and doing another. We'll begin to mock the message of salvation. And that's not where we want to go. How do I know that this is a big time situation with Jesus? Let me read you verse 33. <laughs> he says, snakes, Sons of vipers, 
How will you escape the judgment of hell? This was real with Jesus. He says, I hear what you're saying, but I know who you are. You pretend to be something you are not. But if we begin to clean the inside, then the outside will match. But we miss us, don't we? So do you think Jesus wants to undo hypocrisy in the church? I do. But how? I love this one. Number two, Jesus would rather you be an honest sinner than a lying hypocrite. There is freedom in that, amen? That's what we have to hear today. He says, be honest with yourself that you're a sinner in need of a savior and quit lying to yourself that you've got this figured out. You have nothing figured out without me. He says, be an honest sinner rather than a lying hypocrite. What is your example of faith leading people to? A message of hope or a message of judgment? We have so many stages out there today that we can present ourselves. And Facebook's one of them. A lot of times we put it out there, perfect marriage, perfect family, perfect faith, perfect prayer, all these things. And then behind that, it's all crumbling down. That's not where he wants us to live. He wants us to be honest with our struggles, with our shortcomings. You know, I love Paul. He's one of my favorite in, in, in scriptures. And I identify with him a lot. But in particular, in Romans 7, you have to remember, at one time, this, this man was the one who was killing the Christians. This man was the one that was persecuting the church. And now he has had a life change. His heart is forever changed for Jesus. But he stands before the people. And he is real. He's an honest sinner. And as he presents himself, he says, you know what? I know who I am. I know what I should do, but I don't do it. And I know what I shouldn't do, but I do it over and over again. Thank God for his mercy, for his grace. This is how he spoke to the people. And so many times we miss this. But he didn't just stop there. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, listen to these words of encouragement that he's bringing to a younger man of faith. He says, this is a trust, trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. Are you able to get there? Are you able to understand this truth? He says, but God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst of sinners. And others will realize that too. They can believe in him and receive eternal life. Do you see the beauty in this? And being an honest sinner, understanding a perfect Savior, gives hope to others. But when we pretend that we've got this all figured out, we sprinkle a little bit of Jesus on it, we make everybody, feel out, everybody else feel like they can't get there. That we look down upon them. That we're holier than thou. And that's not what he wants for us. He wants us to follow this example. And too many people, when they get here, why they become a hypocrite is because they say, oh, I'm a victim. I'm a victim of circumstance. We justify it away, and we walk down this road of criticism and sarcasm. But Paul didn't run down that road, did he? He just simply owned it. <laughs> he said, I'm the worst of sinners. But the thing I loved about him, he always preceded that statement with this. The hope for the sinner is Jesus the hope for the sinner is Jesus, and I am the worst of sinners. He didn't want you to focus on him and all of his faults and failures. He wanted you to focus on Jesus. And by the way, I am the worst of sinners. So there is hope for you. He connected with so many people in that moment. When we pretend that sin doesn't have a foothold on us at some level or another, how could Jesus ever use us in that moment? How could we ever show others mercy? If we pretend that we've got this all figured out, when we pretend or hide from the truth of who we are, who's going to be able to identify with us if we're perfect, right? Oh, I know one. The other hypocrites that believe they have no sin issue. That's who will identify with you if you walk this road. 
You know, I know about some spiritual dis- disappointment. I know that there's somebody in your life that has walked that road and disappointed you. you Man, I thought that was a woman of faith. I thought that was a man of faith. And because they failed, I'm not going anymore. I'm telling you, if you come to church here for me, I'm going to tell you to go. If you come here for Christ, I'm going to say stay. It's his church. And you are his people. But I understand that. I've heard so many times where people say, you know what, pastor, I've been hurt at my other churches. And I'm sorry that you've went through that. But if we understand why we go to church, why we surrender our lives, why we give our lives is because of Christ, then we'll have the right focus. But I get it. And I had that happen in my life. A man that I looked up to. He was my spiritual mentor. And he failed miserably in his journey of life. But the thing that I had an issue with was not the sin issue. Yes, I had an issue. Hear me out. But it was the fact that he pretended that he didn't. He lived it out as if nobody would ever know. That's where I had a problem with it. I said, you're a fraud. You're a fake. I can deal with your sin. That's what grace is about. But quit pretending that you don't need Jesus. That has to be true for all of us. There is freedom, church, and being an honest sinner. There is no freedom in being a lying hypocrite. I know who I am. I'm a wretch. I'm one decision every day of my life away from destruction. I know who I am. And I'm so thankful for Jesus. I am so thankful for him. But if you want to be honest with yourself and with God, then take this scripture to heart. In Psalms, we turn there, 139. The first part of it we looked at last week, and it was dealing with worship, understanding that God knows everything about us. But then further down, David says these words, Psalms 139, 23. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the paths of everlasting life. That's what worship led him to. When we live in an illusion, honesty is not a priority. And Jesus called each of us to live in the reality of our need to be saved from our sin, to be saved from ourselves. When's the last time that you allowed God to take an inventory, spiritually speaking, of your life? When was that? Did you catch the phrase that he was mentioning in that Psalms? Offends you, talking about God. (laughs) It's interesting. You may justify being mean to your neighbor, but it offends God. You may justify not paying Uncle Sam his share, but it offends Jesus. For he said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. When we make it more than about us, and we make it about him and his truth, everything changes. Everything should change. Be honest with your struggles. and Allow God to lead you into true righteousness that can be a catalyst for so many others. If we truly want to be led, then we can't choose and pick what we want to adhere when it comes to this. It has to be our complete guide. See this in in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. Amen? Amen. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between the soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. He is the one to whom we are accountable. Do we see God in light of this? Do we understand what he's called us to? You know, God wants to strip us. He really does. Of the things that we try to clothe ourselves with. Pride, arrogance, selfishness, anger, greed, and lust. It's these things. And our lives that cause us to want to run from God, to hide from God, and try to lie to ourselves and others that we're good, we've got this. But what happens typically when you go into a state of hiding? What accompanies that? Fear. Fear accompanies hiding. And Satan knows that, and that's a great tool that he uses. So let's think about this. If he's called us to be an honest sinner... What does that give us? It gives us number three. You have nothing to fear 
when you have nothing to hide. Nothing to fear when you have nothing to hide. Get it under the blood of Christ. Get it behind you. You are forgiven. You are washed clean. That is a promise that he gives to us each and every day of our lives. So let's begin to live there. You know, we've hidden a lot of things in our lives. Things that we don't want other people to know. (laughs) But I promise you, it'll take a toll on your life. It'll tear you apart. The sin and deception in our lives can't be the foundation for which we live our lives. Because if it is, we will always find ourselves hiding from God. Hiding from ourselves. We need to understand that we're sinners. In need of a savior. And often captivated by fear and doubt. Is this a new problem for humanity? I don't think so. I think it's been around from the beginning. In fact, I know it has. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, listen. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. There's a parallel here that he wants us to realize. That in that moment, their sin that they chose to engage in separated them from God, exposed their sinful nature, and they were fearful. Sin made them aware of God's righteousness and their unrighteousness. Their choice in that moment, they saw for the first time God's judgment on such choices. And fear captivated them. The fear in this choice is what we begin to put on our lives when we choose a life of sin apart from the saving grace of Jesus. This is not a message about perfection because it's impossible. But this is a message of hope for us who understand that we're honest sinners in need of a perfect Savior. Now, you may try to hide your sin from God. But let me tell you, it's not possible. You cannot hide these things from God. But yet we try. And when we do this, we welcome fear as our friend. My dad always told me, you become what you hang with. If you hang out in sin, fear will become a part of your life. If you hang out with the Savior, freedom will become part of your life. What do you want? I want freedom. I don't want to live in fear. In fact, we see this in Isaiah 43.1. Isaiah 43, 1. Israel, the Lord who created you, says, Do not be afraid. I will save you. I have called you by name. You are mine. What powerful words he gives to us. Now, you may choose not to know God, not to know his son Jesus, not to know his spirit, but they all know you. Not just by name. They know everything about you. Your fears, your failures, your doubts. So why be clothed with fear when we can be clothed with forgiveness? It's a choice that is right in front of us. But listen to these wise words that come from John. First John, verse 8. Listen to this. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. That's not where he wants us to live. We have to decide our claim on life. Honest sinner or lying hypocrite? An honest sinner has an honest hope. But a lying hypocrite We'll be faced with the honesty, the honest reality of Jesus. Do you remember what it is? (laughs) Why do you call me Lord, Lord, when you do nothing that I say? I don't know you. Away from me. Those are words I never want to hear. But it's by choosing Jesus as truly my Savior. How does God want to handle us? Well, I see this in Psalms 103. In verse 10, he says this to us. He does not punish us for all our sins. 
He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far as us as the east is from the west. That is a message of hope. When we are honestly a sinner, standing before the Savior, he says, it is finished. It is forgiven. You are a new creation in me. That's what he's given to us this day. God knows everything about us. And yes, we deserve hell, but he's given us so much more. He wants us to take off the mask in our life that we so desperately want to wear, that mask that we want so desperately for everybody else to see that we have a life without fault or failure. That isn't your life. That isn't my life. But we have to choose to live outside the illusion and live in the reality that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And thank God for Jesus, amen? So let us live there. And let us create an environment here at TLC where we're not just doing church. We are the church confessing, encouraging, lifting up, supporting, walking with each other. Because I'm a sinner needing support and love. And let me give you my grace as you give grace to me as we see the grace of Christ poured over all of us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, not an easy topic, and I know it was close to your heart, Jesus, that you didn't want us to be lying about who we are. We're wretched. We're filthy. We're dirty. But yet, we are made clean. We are washed free of the sin that has captivated us. The sin that has led us down the road of unrighteousness. Lord, help, uh, help each of us to be honest. Honest before you. Honest before one another. Give us the courage as Paul had the courage to say, I am the worst of sinners, but thank God for Jesus. Father, this world needs to see the brokenness in our lives that has been made complete in Jesus. If we pretend that we've got this figured out, it's going to be so hard for us to be used as a vessel of light. So Father, help us to shine your light, reveal in us what needs to be seen. And may we truly be born again in the name of Jesus. Amen.